Hello and welcome to Crossing Borders, where I have conversations with entrepreneurs and the people who support them, doing business across borders with a special focus on Latin America. My guest today is Pier Paolo Barbieri, an Argentine entrepreneur who is the founder of Walla, a neobank that uses prepaid debit cards and smartphones to allow people to deposit and spend money in Argentina. They have raised more than $10 million in venture capital from investors in the United States and already have clients in every province of Argentina. We talk about how Walla is solving problems for Argentina's underbanked and unbanked, why they decided to make their service 100% free to consumers, and what the finance market looks like in Argentina and the rest of Latin America. We also talk about Pier Paolo's background of studying in the U.S. and U.K. and working in different industries and how it shaped his view of how to launch and scale a business and his hopes for Walla's impact on Argentina and hopefully Latin America. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hey, Pier Paolo, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for taking the time to do it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So where are you in the world today? I'm in Buenos Aires today working with the team uh, on our technology, on our next development, which should be ready for the beginning of June. Awesome. And so what are you working on in, what's, what's your goal with the company? Our goal with Walla is to become the largest issuer of cards in Argentina. We think that it's a market where there's a lot of, 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 uh, of good cards in the market for the top 2% of the population, but over 50% of people in Argentina have never had a card before. And worse than that, only 15% of people in the country have ever had access to a banking-like credit line. So it's an underbanked, um, underlevered country where people don't have access to financial services. We want to change that. So we built the first uh, truly mobile fully free, fully online card, which is a global MasterCard that works anywhere in the world. And you manage it directly from your phone without queues, without branches, and without the hassle of dealing with a really antiquated financial system. And is it in Argentine pesos only or also in dollars? No, it's in Argentine pesos only for now. But our goal is, is you know, obviously to start with a prepaid card that that uh, is basically a checking product where you don't have overdraft. And we will soon get into both credit, meaning lending, and then on the other side, investments to protect the purchasing power of pesos. And so in a high inflationary environment, we think that's an essential uh, feature to add to our users. And we don't want to just be dollars, but we want to create a way for people to save directly on the platform. Perfect. And so we talked a little bit about before in the pre-call about some of the stats that might surprise people who aren't in Argentina or aren't in Latin America about the financial system and the access to uh, credit cards, credit, bank accounts. Can you just talk a little bit about what that's like? Yeah, absolutely. So unfortunately, in Argentina, we have a very educated population and and over 95% of people have a cell phone. Um, over 82% of those cell phones are smartphones that can run you know, modern software on them, meaning Android mostly. It's a 90% Android market, 10% iOS market. Um, in that world, unfortunately, over 50, over 50 percent of people in the country have never used a credit card for a purchase. So around 75 percent of people have some sort of card, but 25 percent of those people, meaning a whole quarter of the population, just goes to the bank once a month and takes out all the cash and then transacts in cash. Um, over the last couple of years, there's been very big changes in the regulation that have opened that up because of the of the size of the undeclared uh, informal economy. So now it is the duty of every um, business in Argentina to take card payments if they process payments above one to two dollars. And so in that world, we see card growth exponential in the next few years. And we wanted to provide an alternative that addressed parts of the market that the banks don't really like or don't really service. So if you make a lot of money and you're in the top 1% or 2% of the population, the banks are amazing to you. They give you benefits, they give you discounts, they give you miles, they give you all these wonderful things. But at the same time, they charge middle class people a lot. For the, In Argentina, there's opening fees, there's maintenance fees, there's closing fees, there's renewal fees, there's even statement fees in most banks. And so we wanted to fight against that and create a product that is always branchless, the way that people want to ban these days, and it was uh, free in a true sense of the term. We wanted to have something that was a completely free card, no opening fee, no maintenance fee, no renewal fee. And that makes us quite unique um, in the market. 
It also is the only card in the market that can process live transactions because all the credit cards in Argentina process transactions via batch. But because we built our own system with state-of-the-art technology, we're able to give you notifications when you transact, which is pretty unique in the market. And unfortunately, Latin America is really behind on that issue. So it's not just in Argentina, but also in Chile and in Uruguay and, and in Colombia that people process not live. And so the merchant can, can charge you something two days later and you will only notice in your statement three to five days later. And, and, and that does not help people trust cards and, and move into uh, electronic means of payment, even if the world is going in that direction. So Walla is a project of financial inclusion and, and, and expansion so that we can you know, give cards to people that never had it before and with a better suite of technology products appeal to those people that maybe had a card but, but, uh, but didn't like the experience that they were getting uh, from the bank. Just to put it in context, 70% 70, 70 of people in Argentina below the age of 30 would rather go to the dentist than go to the bank. There is no place in the world that banks are more uh, hated than in Argentina especially because of what happened in 2001. So we, we always like to say that we're here to change that. So with all of those stats about what it's like in Latin America and Argentina in the financial sector, where else in the world have you seen potential models or inspiration for what you're doing where that maybe makes more sense than what's gone on in the US that has a more developed system? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a great question. So neobanks have been developed mostly in Europe. So there's cases of German neobanks, British neobanks, um, you know, Russian neobanks, because in Europe, one of the big drivers was the problem of foreign exchange fees. So, so you know, it's a, it's a continent where people used to pay a lot to change into uh, Swiss francs or into dollars or into euros. Um, and so there's a lot of people that have started branchless institutions that need not be banks. And in fact, we believe in not being a bank because uh, we think that financial inclusion and, and innovation is done outside of the traditional uh, institutions that used to create um, uh, for, for, for these markets. And so, you know, we think that, that that's a unique pro value proposition. But more crucially, everybody in Germany already knows what a free card is. Um, people in the Netherlands always joke to me that they don't know what it is to pay for a card. Whereas in the emerging markets, it's all the other way around. So I think that the neobanking experience, as we are seeing in places like India and China, it is much more compelling in the emerging markets, even if it's more developed in the developed markets. So going back, I'm going to switch gears for a second and go back to, uh, to you. So where are you from originally? So I'm from Argentina. I grew up in Argentina and, um, and I left when I was 18 to study in the U.S. Um, I went to the U.K. for my master's, came back to the U.S. and worked in the U.S. for for quite a while, and then I'm you know coming back to Argentina for this for this project. So you're you're an entrepreneur in fintech now. Did you study anything related to finance or something different? I'm a historian. I'm an economic historian. So um, I studied finance, economics, and history. So having a, a different background than finance to do finance is fairly common for entrepreneurs in the U.S. and maybe other parts of the world. But in Latin America, you kind of get looked at funny. I, I studied political science and people kind of look at you funny if you didn't study finance and are in finance. Can you talk a little bit about how that's helped you yeah, uh, I mean, start a, a finance business? To, to, be, to be frank, I, I share your experience. In fact, I remember telling people I was studying history when I was in college in the U.S. and people back home would tell me, Oh my God, you'll never have a job. Um, and so, you know, I come from a very different kind of upbringing. I did the liberal arts study, which is something I always recommend to my friends and, and to my younger friends, especially. I think that's an amazing part of the American college system. And then I think that having a historical background allows you to understand certain things. A bank is a physical place only because when middle classes were created in the uh, early 19th century in Britain and in France, they needed a physical place where the transactionality of being a bank, of somebody taking deposits, intermediating, and then issuing credit needed to be established in the middle because you didn't know if the other person had credibility or not. But today, that historical experience is no longer valid. I don't need to know uh, Nathan in person or have a physical place to meet my banker that intermediates between Nathan and myself in order for me to establish that Nathan has good credit. We can replace that. And in fact, it's an anachronism to keep opening branches that actually don't really give more people more access. When we started Walla, and one of the things I'm most proud of is 
within 72 hours of launch with zero marketing, we were able to issue cards in the 25 provinces that make up Argentina. There are only seven banks that have presence in all those provinces of Argentina. And we did it in 72 hours because we were destroying the physical experience and turning that experience upside down and recreating it in a phone. And I think that is what creates innovation when you're able to really question why an institution is the way it is and provide a, a way for it to change. So this podcast is called Crossing Borders, and you've definitely crossed borders in in life, moving from Argentina to US to UK, back to Argentina. What kind of cultural differences did you see or culture shocks did you have jumping from place to place that maybe help you today with the business? Well, I think that, that you know, I think the innovation doesn't work when you just copy what's, what you have somewhere else. And I think it does work when you build a product for the place where you're launching, right? So, you know, we didn't tell anybody we were doing Walla. We, we worked for two years nonstop. Nobody talked because we wanted to be innovative for real and not, you know, over promise and under deliver. We wanted to under promise and over deliver. And, um, and I always say I expected to have 5,000 cards in the first three months, and we have 35,000 cards um, that we issued in the, in the first three months of, of existence. And that really surprised us. But what, what we learned is that you need to create a product that fits in the place. Uh, people thought it was crazy to innovate in Argentina, and now you know, all those people that, didn't, that, that thought we were crazy are trying to either emulate us, buy us, or invest in us. And we find that wonderful. Uh, and we want to inspire other people to just look into a specific market and try to design products that appeal to those people. And just because it's never been done before, it doesn't mean that it won't work. It means that that you really need to find a product fit that 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 goes with the market and goes with the needs of people that, in many cases, have been ignored for a long, long time. In case of the you know, the financial industry. So, talking about people that have been ignored um, up until fairly recently. It's and still still true today. It's very difficult for most Latin American entrepreneurs outside of, say, Brazil to raise venture capital, much less venture capital from the U.S. And you've been able to raise some and um, along with many companies in, say, the last six to 12 months in, in LATAM. What do you think is changing and what advice do you, would you give to other Latin American founders who are looking to potentially raise capital from abroad? Well, obviously, I, I because of my previous life, I had I had some experience with some of these people. I, in fact, some of the ones that have backed me um, were people that told me to start this business. When I started thinking about it, they were like, "You really need to do this. It's not only potentially a wonderful success, but also you know something really good, and that makes us feel good. We have a very strong social mission at Walla, and that's important to us." The advice that I would give um, in direct terms is to go tell the story and do it in English uh, because it's important. There are a lot of people unlike this podcast that don't cross borders enough and you really need to educate them with regards to the society and the place and the opportunity before we even get to your product. Um, and so that may take a long time, but it's really worth it because people really in the U S have a culture of understanding that not all businesses will make money in the first year. In fact, at Walla, we're proud to be losing money right now because we think we're building a community and a base that is engaged like no other that we have seen. And so, um, and so we're, we're really proud of that. And we think that people in other geographies are more used to venture investing. And so they're willing to take the time and the effort to really build a superior product and not to, you know, monetize two seconds after launch. Um, and so that gives us, gives you confidence and gives you bandwidth and it gives you the ability to, to grow at your own pace. The other thing I would say, it's essential to have a really, really good team that you can sell and that they can support you because nobody can do anything alone. And, and you know, people sometimes focus on me and do these things about me, you know, we have wonderful retention on Walla. Everybody who has started with me, this project is still there. Um, it's been over two and a half years. And and that's something else that it's important to show to other people that, that it's not just one person that believes in this, but a, that a team that is able to execute. And um, and that's that's really something that we're we're quite proud of. Um, and, and finally, I would say, you know, that, that we need to educate people in Latin America to invest this way. We currently don't have any Argentine investors and some people really want to get in now, but I always say that they would have never believed. And when I started talking about this, a lot of people said, you know, why would you ever want to create a free card if people pay for it? So, you know, it takes time for people to change their minds and it takes good, good innovators of which we have a lot in Latin America and excellent talent of which we have a lot to go tell that story. 
So jumping back a little bit to you, you talked about your, your previous life. So <clears throat> you went from a fairly traditional path of, of studying at university and then uh, working for a little while in, in a more traditional sector and then now made the jump to being an entrepreneur. Can you talk a little bit about how you decided to do that and and if you knew you were always going to be an entrepreneur or if it's something that just sort of came up in the in the path no i i didn't think so i you know i had started a business before it was more of a consulting business with my mentor so i was a very very junior partner in that uh and then walla came around because i really thought that this was a wonderful idea and there was nobody else doing it and so i thought it was kind of my duty to go do it not just because i think it's going to be a really great business and because we think we can really disrupt by providing access to people who had only been ignored before, but also because it's, I think there's a social good in doing that. And I think that that, and you can see it in the social media response to Walla and the amazing engagement that we have, that people go and become evangelists of a product that, that is not only really good, but also more importantly, accessible. And so we didn't want to create a product where we had to turn down 90% of people. We wanted to give a product where we can give everybody a card, trust them to, to learn it, to use it, to change and change with them and develop the things that they want. And so I was kind of in the position where if nobody else is doing it and everybody thinks it's a good idea and it's, I'm lucky to have partners that, that really said to me, you know, you got to go do this and they convinced me to do it. And so here we are. So one of the, one of the things that is a common theme with many of the entrepreneurs that I've talked with on, on this podcast is that when they decide to start that business, their family and friends are are not always very supportive or not, maybe don't understand going off that more traditional path. Uh, what was the your experience in your case? No, I mean, everybody's been super supportive. Um, I mean, I, I think my family was not supportive when I said I was going to go to study in the US when I was 17, because that's not really it jives with the local culture of Argentina, especially in an Italian family. But in this case, everybody was amazingly supportive. And my friends um, you know, both from the U.S. and from Argentina, all thought it was a wonderful idea. And the first thing that they said is, can we invest and support you? So I didn't have that experience. In fact, um, you know, but it may be because I, I, you know, I have a lot of friends that, that, that have experiences in the U.S. And, and where, where failure is not, um, is not something to be ashamed of. Um, and I think culturally that is extremely important. Um, and, and I realized that, that while I may not succeed, you know, we're very happy to have gone th how things have gone, but you never know. And, and, uh, and if we, and, and if I always say that if all we did was to wake up those giants that had ignored the young, the foreigners and, and, and the middle classes for so long in the financial system, then that's great. We will have succeeded with that. So, um, you know, I, I'm lucky to have amazing support from my friends and mentors, uh, and my family as well. So I, 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 in my experience, that's actually been a great asset. So you mentioned Walla's uh, social mission and some of the good that you think that you might be able to do with the company. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, every day, uh, whenever you get a Walla card, you, you have my personal email. So I get emails from a lot of people. Some people complain about this not working or that not working, but a lot more people talk to us about how they use the product and why it's important to them. And so there are people that tell me that this is the first time that they have a way to save that isn't in cash, so it's safer, and they don't have to be afraid at night that somebody's going to you know, come into their homes and take what they have. From other places where we hear from people that, that the banks had never given them a kind of account, if you believe it, there's a law in Argentina that, that says that everybody has a right to a free uh, savings account, but a lot of banks blockade the access of certain people and certain social strata to the banking system. And I'm really ashamed of that in my country, and I want to change that. So the fact that people write to us and say, look, I never had an income before that was declared, and, and you know, I really wanted to have a bank account, a place to save, a place to pay, and, and now I do with Walla. And, and we have over 10,000 people that are now signed up on Netflix because they have a Walla. And Netflix has given us their free brand. We can use their brand for free because they realize all these are users that used to be on Netflix by borrowing passwords or stealing passwords or worse. There are people that sell app passwords, access in cash for double the price because people didn't have a means of payment. And, and, you know, if we disrupt that and we are able to provide ways for people to access the services that they want, the things that they want, the savings that they want, uh, and do it in a, in a good, honest way where we're not trying to, you know, hide a fee and if we ever charge anything it is it is transparent and upfront on our website and on our all our communications then people realize that that's differential 
and then they become your best ambassadors and they go and recommend the products to their friends and to their and to their families because it's an honest it's great technology but at the same time it's an honest and direct product and it's transparent so we just don't want it to be free but we also want it to be simple and accessible in a way that benefits us all so at some point um you'll probably need to start generating some income and so you talked about keeping it free. What are some of the ways that you could make money in the future? I mean, we do generate income. We, uh, we have a very high interchange rate in Argentina. So every merchant that takes MasterCard pays a, pays a, a percentage of, of, of the, every purchase to MasterCard, and we get a piece of that. So it's not that we don't get any income, but we don't charge for the cards. That's a differential. And we have a radically different cost structure than all the financial institutions that have existed because um, we issue cards through an app where we don't have branches, we don't have to pay for a fixed structure, and we're not a bank. Well, but in the, on, on the other hand, we cannot, you know, obviously lend the deposits that people put on. Uh, but but in the future, we think that we can we can help people build credit histories and eventually uh, lend people money. So that was that was more where I was going for on the lending side. What where do you see that going, and and what's kind of the the model that could potentially work for a country like Argentina, where there isn't potentially a credit score for a big chunk of the population? Right. So what we do in one of the things that we do in Walla is to provide the first fully, I mean the first and only thus far personal financial management software. So everything that you spend on Walla is categorized automatically and it's graphed over months or or by category or however you want. And that data will help us underwrite credit, I think, in a better way than, than traditional financial institutions. So our goal is to give banking-like rates to people who have never had a credit line and start small, but, but build it over time, and then give to people who have a banking line a better APR in the end. But we're not there yet. We, you know, we only launched seven months ago. So at this point, we're just trying to keep pace with the amount of cards that people ask uh, every day. So you talked a little bit about um, the the interest rates and sort of credit scores for, for people in the traditional system. For people that are in the U.S. or outside of Latin America that don't really understand the difference where, you know, everyone's got a, a FICO score in the, in the U.S., what's that look like in Argentina? Well, there, I mean, if, if 50% of people don't usually transact in plastic and don't do it all on, on cash, so a lot of people, you know, 30% of the economy is undeclared income then it's impossible for a bank to really analyze a lot of clients. So what they do is do the same thing and they give credit to only 10 to 15% of the population. And so the rest of the population either has no credit line, meaning that they cannot be entrepreneurs themselves, they cannot change their car, they cannot upgrade their home, they cannot you know, start a project, or they have to go to places where they get credit at 300, 400, 500% APRs, which is you know credit sharks or loan sharks that that are the only alternative they have. And so, you know, that is a market that I think will be disrupted and we hope that Walla will be part of that process. Yeah, and in Chile, they have something called DCOM, which is basically only for your bad things that you do by not paying. So you may have had 10 years of paying all of your bills on time and then one day that you just don't pay and the only thing that's on your credit report is that one negative thing. Is Argentina similar? Not directly. I mean, there is a there is a central bank record of all the banking um, of all the banking uh, experiences that somebody's had. It is focused on the negative, but it's not just the negative. Um, I didn't know this about Chile, but it seems quite uh, quite harsh. It is. It definitely is. So, where do you see Walla going in the next, say, one to three years? Well, we hope that, you know, Walla will, will deepen the product. We will finish what we call the, the prepaid product or our checking product. And then we will launch um, credit products as well as eventually savings products. And we think that, that in a year from now, we will make traditional financial institutions completely redundant on a, on a usability and, and availability of, of uh, features. Um, you know, what we have seen, I always say, is just the beginning and the best is yet to come. And we're in the process of developing it as we speak. And then I think that we will also go international. So you talked about the finan traditional financial system. You must have gotten some amount of feedback from, from the traditional banks and uh, yeah, the system in, in Argentina so far. Do you have any sort of feedback that you can share of what they think of what you're doing? 
Well, on the one hand, you know, when, when we first talked about it with people in the market, people thought it was impossible to do. And that A, we would not be able to build it, B, that we will not be able to make it really free, and C, that, that if we did all those things, nobody would take it up. Um, I'm happy that all those things were wrong and we did it anyway. Um, and now, you know, there's a lot of people that come to talk to us. There, there's a lot of interest and, and people, uh, and I think that, that copying is a form of flattery. So that when I see banks try to launch freer products, which end up not being really free, uh, I'm happy about it because it means that we're doing something right. So, but, but it's not just that kind of interest. I think there's a lot of people that, that are, are approaching us and, and telling us it's a great job and helping us spread their voice without having to spend on marketing because our best marketing is a, is a superior product with better technology where, you know, there are features that I was seeing that Wells Fargo launched two months ago in the U S like, you know, freeze your card that we had in Argentina before that. So, you know, that makes me very happy. No, it's a great vision. Um, so I have a couple of last questions that I like to ask everyone at the end. Absolutely, um, I love that. So, what uh, what would you what advice would you give yourself if you could go back to when you were just starting the business or thinking about starting the business, knowing what you know today? What would you what would you tell yourself? I'm a really anxious guy, so what I would tell myself is it'll get done. Don't try to rush everybody all the time because you know things take longer um, when you're innovating, and and things take a lot longer in Latin America. And do you have any books, blogs, podcasts, documentaries? websites that you like to recommend either for people that, you know, just help them in their lives or even to more directly to entrepreneurs uh, thinking about starting a business that you like to recommend? Well, I mean, I, 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 I the fear of being cliche, um, I think that, that Teal Zero to One is an amazing book for anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur. Um, I think it, it, it really highlights the problems and the choices really closely. But in the you know, it's not a it's not a typical uh, book for for the fintech. It's more about sort of entrepreneurship in general. Um, I I always I mean, as a, as an economist, I think, and as an economic historian, I think that everybody that wants to to innovate should read some financial history. And so, in that sense, financial history, I would recommend the Ascent of Money by my mentor Neil Ferguson or the Lords of Finance, uh, which is a great book about about the interwar years. And central banking, and finally, I, I I've done my own work on, uh, which is a book on on Nazi economics called Hitler's Shadow Empire. So if anybody wants to read about my historian past before entrepreneurship, you can find it on Amazon as well. It's called Hitler's Shadow Empire. Yeah, it looks really interesting. I uh, I was reading some of the the re the overview and reviews. looks looks very interesting. Um, so I was, making a last joke. I was making a joke that we should give everybody that book that signs up on Walla and then I'll really be a bestseller. <laughs> yeah, you can, uh, you can buy the, uh, the copies direct off Amazon. You'll jump right off the rankings. Exactly. <laughs> and so last question for you. So a lot of people from the U S and Europe and now even China are potentially looking at Latin America as a market that might be interesting for investing or even potential expansion. What advice would you give to um, people looking at Latin America from abroad as a potential market uh, about either whether they should do it or operating or what you think might happen? Okay, um, I think that that you know that innovation in Latin America is about to take a giant leap forward. I think there are amazing um, opportunities coming around, and I think that that forget about Walla. There's a there's a generation of entrepreneurs that will change. Latin America and there's a lot of things to be done. And so I think that they should be looking at it and should, you should be meeting entrepreneurs from there because there are a lot of markets where we can take a massive leap forward and we can create real giants because there's a lot of purchasing power in, in Latin America, growing middle classes, really, really good demographics and amazing um, growth uh, prospects. So, you know, the value of technology in those, in those situations where you can leapfrog is quite amazing. And, uh, um, and, and I think that they should all be looking at it, um, well, well beyond Walla. And I think there's a lot of, not just in Chile and in Colombia, but also in, in Mexico and in Argentina, there are, and obviously in Brazil, there are, um, entrepreneurship hubs that are being created and people are taking more risks and better risks and with amazing business plans and ideas. I think you're spot on, especially on the part about leapfrogging. I think that what you're doing is 
for allowing 60, 70, 80% of people in Argentina to leapfrog the traditional finance system, just like most people in Latin America and also Africa leapfrogged the landline telephones and went straight to mobile. I think that that's, that's what's happening in Latin America right now, and it's super interesting. So I'm glad you're, you're on the forefront. Great. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time, and I appreciate you uh, doing it. Great. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Crossing Borders as much as I did. I really believe that fintech companies in Latin America have the opportunity to make the biggest impact on people's lives of any of the other industries out there. So it's really fun to hear about a company that's really growing quickly. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, please let us know either on social media or via review on iTunes or Stitcher. And don't forget to share it with a friend. Thanks again, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.